Hello, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Joe's Ventures, and today, a little late, but I thought I really want to take a little break from Planet Zoo, because of all those mod spotlights I made, so we're going to be taking our time to review the Planet Zoo Africa pack. So, this was a cool pack, I liked this pack, all the cool stuff that came with it, not necessarily an animal pack, which is fine, it's cool that we get another theme, especially an African theme, but we got a good selection of animals, and I'm excited to get into it, so... Just like our other packs, we're going to be starting with the uh, habitat animal. We have got the Sarah Beetle, or the Sacred Scarab. So let's just go Old F2 to get a good view. So like that, look at that. We've got the video Ansel. And we can skip out of that and watch them move. We can see this wonderful video view. We have got the... Uh, the species here is uh, Sacroberus uh, uh, Sacer, or how you pronounce that, so the Sacred Scarab. So this species occurs in lots of coastal dunes and marshes all across uh, the Mediterranean Basin. So it can be found in North Africa, Southern Europe, parts of Asia, including Afghanistan, uh, Cyprus, Ethiopia, France, places like that. Just all sorts of places around those areas. Those are some of the countries that you can find in. And they tend out to be really pretty much exclusively a coastal species and only found in really dunes and coastal marshes. So what's really interesting about these guys as well is that they have a vestigial claw that might uh, have a distance for digging on their back legs and they have these really cool five segments and stuff. And obviously they get the name dung beetle from being copophagus, which means they eat poop or animal uh, feces. That's the technical Latin word for it, copophagus. And they typically uh, get these dung balls, as you can see quite famously, look right here. Hold it like that, really, really cool. Let's see if we can find one moving around this one there with dung ball. <laughs> really cool. So what they do is they ball it up like that, and then they move it and kind of move it around. They sculpt into that ball, and when the female's ready to breed, she takes it and makes that ball, and then she digs it. Puts it in the ground. It looks like she's falling over there. That's quite cute. Put it in the ground. She lays a single large egg in there and then she seals it and then repeats the process. She lays an egg, repeats it, digs a ball, kind of repeats it. And then typically they'll produce about only half a dozen young in her life. But this is a good strategy that works for them apparently. And the larvae feed on the ball of feces until the hatches. And. What's really cool about these guys is that even though they're an assuming little dung beetle, they actually have a very, very uh, big significance in human culture. They're pretty much the most famous of the scarab beetles, and they are considered like a symbol of the sun god Ra from uh, ancient Egyptian like um, religion and mythology. So that's really gives them a big thing, and that's why they're considered to be sacred. And Egyptians also observed young beetles emerging from the balls of dung, and they mystically interpreted uh, that as the male beetle was able to reproduce without needing a female and simply ejected his sperm into the ball of the dung. And that was a bit weird, but I think these guys have a really, really cool place in history. And I honestly think they were kind of a fun choice because we were getting these cool little insects and things. And kind of complains about, oh, the megafauna. We only focus on megafauna. But it's really cool to see a bunch of variety of different small things. Microfauna is probably some of the most interesting stuff, in my opinion, and we can see them moving around. Really nice habitat animal. Wonderful. So now we're going to be moving on to our first exhibit animal. No, habitat animal. This exhibits habitat, how you define it. And we're going to be having a look at the African penguin. So here's a really cool animal. I really like African penguins. Also known as the South African penguin or the Cape penguin. They're confined to Southern Africa. And like ex like all penguins, they are flightless, and they can get pretty decent sizes. They can get between 2.2 to 3.5 kilos uh, as adults, and about 60 to 70 centimeters tall. And the way that you can tell them apart from other species of uh, penguins is that they have these really distinctive markings with these nice patterns and this pink uh, across the eye that really gives them their own special... Uh, and the black facial markings give them their own distinct look that defines, helps identify them as you're looking for them. And there's the pink lads that you can see here. They are for uh, thermoregulation. So that allows them to control their body temperatures. And these guys are pursuit divers. 
They feed on fish and squids, and often they're pretty numerous, and they're declining rapidly due to a combination of several threats and are considered endangered. So, these guys are found around like Namibia, Southern Africa, and as I mentioned, they're quite big boys. And they're just really cool animals. They feed on all sorts of pelagic fish. They feed on like sardines, anchovies, or specifically Southern African anchovies, along with marine vertebrates. Oh, they're having, having a bit of a fight there. Uh, and they usually uh, pretty much swim between within 20 kilometers of the shore and consume about 540 grams of food per day. And these guys are monogamous. They pair. They pair for life pretty much. They return, return to the same site to breed every year, and they have extended breeding season with uh, nesting usually happens and peaking during March to May in Southern Africa, and November to December in Namibia. And a clutch of two eggs is usually laid in burrows dug with guano or scrapes, and they're usually incubated by both parents for the next 40 days. Well, until that, we talk about the babies. Very, very much cuties, wonderful little animals. And... When penguins molt, they're usually unable to go out to the water because they're not yet waterproof. So they tend to like fast over this period, even if they are provided food in captivity. And they take up to three weeks to molt, so they kind of just rely on their fat reserves. And sadly, these guys uh, were considered African penguin eggs are considered it's gallic, were considered and still are kind of not really a de gallic delicacy. Couldn't you say that probably? So even between like the 1950s, about 12,000 eggs were collected, and that's what part of the reason why they're considered endangered. Also, there's a big issue of oil spills around local areas. Uh, so that's, like other animals, they're susceptible to the chemicals and stuff that you can be found in oils and this kind of industries. And they obviously compete with fisheries as well, and so that's more fish that goes into the penguin's mouth, less that goes into the people's mouth, so that's competition for them. So they are considered endangered, and there is their population is approximately across their native range, probably about 50,000 birds, and sadly declining. So that's kind of sad. But they are commonly seen in zoos, as they uh, do not require particularly low temperatures like your sort of average penguin, because most penguins do like cooler temperatures. I want to see if you swim. Are you going to dive from me, or are you going to chillax? I think they might need to flip it. Nah, I won't. I won't worry about it. We'll just look at that. I think that looks a little bit more accurate. Look at this wonderful guy. Isn't that awesome? See, common zoo animal, uh, common zoo uh, penguin, and I think these guys are really wonderful animals. And since I forgot, what we're going to do is quickly go back to the scarab beetle and look at the zoopedia. See what they need. The zoopedia, they are. So as I mentioned, native to coastal dunes. So pretty much just covers what I said. That pretty much covers their range. Pretty big group there, and males will fight over females and dung bulls. So they're solitary, but will compete in mates. So pretty much what I went over. Six months, all like that, and they really cool fans. They use the projections on the head and front legs to shape them and in, uh, dung into spheres, and can roll balls of dung at fifty times their weight. Sacred scarab beetles roll dung, pushing it with the back of the legs, and the sacred scarab was uh, yeah, pretty much things I already mentioned. And we'll have a look at the African penguin now. Where we have these cuties here. Let's have a look at you. So, 41,700 is here. Pretty much all I mentioned. You can see their range covering about the southern parts of Africa, Namibia, and South Africa. And a pretty big group, too. You can have up to 5,000. They're very social and live in these large colonies, and they mate for life. They're monogamous, which is really cool. And they can you can put humans in there as well. That's cool. I don't really care about people. Age of sexual maturity is about four years. Uh, age of sexual sterility 14, so you've got 10 years of good breeding. With two babies, pretty good. Yeah, nothing too difficult about them. Cool animal. How can you not love good pingus? Good pingus, or even great pingus. So then we're going to move on to the next. We're going to move on to some mammals. We have got here the wonderful fennec fox. So, the fennec fox is a small little crepuscular fox that means they only come out during the day uh, early morning and in the late uh, afternoon so they tend to get to hang out at this cooler times they're found in the Sahor, uh, sahara desert and uh, sonali peninsula and then the most distinctive feature about these little guys you can see they've got these really really big ears which are used as a way to thermoregulate so they use the large surface area of the ears to dissipate heat from their bodies 
And they also have lots of cool adaptations like the eyes, the coat, and they actually have enlarged kidneys to help adapt to desert environments with high temperatures and little waters. And their hearing as well is really sensitive and that really helps with their prey. They can hear prey moving underground and they mainly eat insects, small mammals and birds. So they're pretty generalist. And they have a lifespan of up to 14 years in captivity and about 10 years in the wild. And their main predators are about uh, the Ventrix eagle owl, jackals and other large mammals. And they dig families, they live in families, they dig out burrows, and they use the in the sand that they use for habitation and protection, which can be as large as 120 meters squared or 1,292 square feet, and adjoin these burrows with other families, so they do social to some extent. And even though, sadly, there's not any precise population figures that can be estimated uh, from sightings, they indicate that these guys are not currently threatened. It looks like they're doing okay, and... They are pretty cotton pretty common captive pets as well, and uh, they are sort of their fur is prized by native peoples of North Africa, and then so that's pretty cool. Really, really wonderful animals. They have a females range in body size from thirty four point five centimeters uh, to thirty nine centimeters uh, long, or that's thirteen to fifteen inches, with a twenty to twenty three to twenty five centimeter tail and a nine centimeter uh, long yeah. ears and they weigh up to about nine to 1.9 kilos with males being slightly larger between 39 to 39.5 23 to 25 uh, centimeter tail and 10 centimeter long ears and weigh at least 1.3 kilos so these are really really cool guys let's have a look at the babies while we're talking about reproduction where are my babies look at my baboons they're so very cute very very cute so these guys generally reach sexual maturity about nine months old between January and April, and they usually only breed once per year. And the copulation time lasts for about two hours and forty-five minutes, and gestation for these guys lasts about fifty to fifty-two days, and sometimes up to twenty-three days or sixty-three days. And after mating, the male become very aggressive and protects the female. Good lad provides her with food and during pregnancy and lactation, and the female give birth between March and June to a litter of one to four. And they open their eyes at about 11 days old. Look at this cutie. He's running around. So both females and males take care of the pups. And they communicate by barking, purring, yapping, and squealing. And pups remain with their family even after new litter is born. And they're weaned after 61 to 70 days. So really cool animals. And luckily they aren't. They seem to be least concerned. So that's really good. And a wonderful zoo animal. Really cute pick for Planet Zoo. I think they're good. good choice. Look how cute they are. Very cute. Where's mum and dad? There's three juveniles here. It looks but where's mum and dad? Mum and dad must be here somewhere. They can't really get in there, but it is what it is. Hmm. Parents go over here somewhere. I think that's the parents here. Parents down. Cutie. Cutie cutie cutie. And moving from one cutie to another cutie, we've got something that pretty much everyone has been asking for, along with the other animals that we got in this pack. This was a pack filled with stacked animals. We have got the meerkat. Oh, and then we need to go have a look at the thing as well. See, I, I need to get better organized, don't I? Keep thinking, I just spit out information, I look at the Zoopedia. See if you can see this wonderful Zoopedia image. Uh, so you can see their range here around the Sahara Desert. 1 to 10, so there's 6 males, 6 females, so they're social and live in these packs. And that's where you get it. They are monogamous, and they have an alpha male and female. I mentioned pretty much the size. Uh, sexual maturity about a year old, 8 years old to become sterile. 2 to 5 uh, pups per mating event. Gestation is 1 month, interbreeding is 12 months, and they're pretty easy to reproduce in captivity. So yeah, forgive me, we're going to go back to the meerkats and see where it's at with the meerkats. And look at these wonderful guys. So, these guys are a small mongoose species uh, found in the parts of Southern Africa. They're really charismatic because of things like meerkat manner and such. They have this really, really uh, broad head with large eyes and this pound point snout. And this, like, colouring pattern, I think the term is bridled. And they have a head to body length of about 24 to 32 centimeters or 9.4 to 13 inches long. And typically between 0.62 to 970 kilos. Uh, no, 0 0.97 kilos. Uh, 970 kilos would be huge for a meerkat. It would be huge for pretty much anything. And uh, so they typically weigh between 1.4 to 2.1 pounds. 
and they have this really cool light gray pattern that you see with this ultimate poorly defined dark bands along with around their eyes and they have full claws adapted to digging and they have an ability to regulate their body temperature to survive in really harsh climates and look at these guys having fun wonderful 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 so meerkats are you social which is really interesting and they form packs of two to thirty individuals that occupy home ranges of about five kilometers in area they have a very very strong social hierarchy with uh, dominant individuals in the pack breeding and producing offspring and the non-breeding subordinate members provide care to the pups so even though they're not breeding themselves they still care for the breeding uh, animals uh, babies which is pretty interesting and they live in like rocks crevices stony um calcareous areas and large burrow systems in the plains and they burrow is typically five meters long in diameter uh five meters in diameter about 15 openings and they have these large underwater uh not underwater underground uh networks this thing of two or three levels of tunnels that you see here look I'm diving in there where's he gonna pop out where's he gonna pop out where are you gonna pop out yeah i popped out there <laughs> Funny, funny, funny. Oh, nope. He's making a new one. Oh. There we are. Hey, buddy. Wonderful animal. <laughs> meerkats are great. <laughs> I love meerkats. So these tunnels can get to about 7.5 centimeters high and be uh, stand up to 1.5 meters into the ground. And they have these moderate uh, internal temperatures, these burrows have. So they kind of pretty stable temperatures. And provide a comfortable microclimate for to protect the meerkats from past weather and also helps with the babies and such which is really really cool so meerkats are active during the day mostly during the early morning and late afternoon and they remain consistently alert in their burrows where they stand up on their back legs and go what was that before the hyenas come <laughs> really great <laughs> so they have a broad variety of causes uh, calls as well uh, to communicate to one another for different purposes so they alarm for predators and such they're really social so they have a lot of communication within each other and they get these guys are also primarily insectivorous so they eat a lot of insects including things like arthropods uh, beetles and be uh, butterflies and things like that just pretty much but they will also eat small amphibians uh, birds small birds small reptiles and plant material so they're pretty Primarily insectivorous, but they will eat other things. They're pretty generalist in that regard. And speaking of breeding, we're going to have a look at the little babies. Now, look how cute these are. Wouldn't you agree these guys are adorable? With a bull. Very, very cute little baby meerkats. Love them. So, breeding occurs uh, around the year with peaks during heavy rainfall. And, of course, these will only be by the dominant... Uh, animals in the hierarchy so only the dominant animals get to breed so this is usually about just uh, a gestation of 60 to 70 days uh, of a litter with three to seven pups where obviously they're weaned by the mother until they can either make their own prides or not their own pride um their own communities or just say subservient to the dominant pair in theirs it just depends what happens if you've seen meerkat manor you know it's quite dramatic but you cannot not love meerkat manor. So these guys are pretty common in arid habitats where they live. Uh, around like southwestern Botswana, western Namibia, northern and western South Africa. And range that barely extends into southwestern Angola. So not a... With no significant threats to their population. At least they are considered least concern by the IUCN. So there's nothing too much going on with these guys that is a conservation issue. Other than the really basic things like habitat destruction... But they seem to be doing okay at the moment. Which is cute. And look at like, how they stick their tails up. That's adorable. And they're widely uh, distribute, uh, seen in te television, movies, and media. Also a very, very common zoo animals because they're very charismatic. And you can keep them in a really small area and have people interact with them. I think they're a cool animal. Really cool. Pretty much any zoo has a meerkat. Well, a group of meerkats. Kind of just one that's against animal welfare because they are social really cool colony to have really wonderful animals so yeah and we got yeah well, i was gonna say we got to see the rhinos but we got to have a look at these so we don't know the population of well social mongoose pretty much as i mentioned we can see their range here you can see that africa south africa botswana less low as well by the looks of it 
and they have big groups up to 20 males up to 20 females bachelor groups can have up to 12 females are a bit more uh, the females are kind of the bossy ones they're a very matriarchal society and you can put them with humans which is awesome and they can mention get 30 centimeters long that's their body length and lives lifespan of 15 years so they reach sexual maturity about three years they eat cereal when they die produce three to six offspring per mating event and they just date for about two months and the interbirth period is about 12 months so not very hard to breed and let's have a look at these guys running with their tails isn't that cute when they stick their tails up adorable animals great incredible amazing oh he, he just sent it over there wow rude that's rude man that's rude this is dirty water i think i might just quickly uh just do it water clean let's see we'll do that and then we'll move on to the rhinoceros uh, where is it? Okay. I'll put a filter there. Just quickly. I'll just be creative right now. Just put a filter there quickly. Utilities. Okay, there we are. That'll sort out the water. It's already cleaning already. It's good, good, good. So now we'll be moving on to our big boys of the lot. Really, another animal everyone's been asking for. Everyone wanted some sort of African rhino. And we have got here, along with a couple of cute babies. <laughs> Great, we have got the white rhinoceros. Or specifically, this is the southern white rhinoceros. Because the northern white rhinoceros is in a very sad state right now. So... The white rhinoceros, or the square-lipped rhinoceros, is the largest living species of rhinoceros and have these really, really wide mouths uh, for grazing. And they're the most social of all the living rhino species. They live in small groups, and that's reflected in their social group in Planet Zoo, which is really cool. So they are two subspecies. The southern white rhinoceros is the most common rhino at the moment. There is estimated about 19,000 to 21,000 wild living individuals, which is very, very good. Even though that's still a far cry, probably what they were. And the much rarer northern white rhino, there are very few uh, individuals left. There's probably two alive right now. And the last male, Sudan, uh, died in 2018, which sucks. So these are a very popular zoo animals as well. They're very, very big, very, very big rhinos. So they are the largest of them all. They can get to about 3.7 to 4 meters or 12 to 13 feet in males and 3.4 to 3.65 meters or 11 to 12 feet in females. So their tail also adds another 70 centimeters and their shoulder height, which is between 170 to 186 centimeters tall or 5 foot to 6 foot. So basically they're the same height as your average 6 foot man, even though they're mostly i'll say that's a pretty big animal pretty big boy and they're very very heavy males average about 2300 kilos or about a little over 5000 pounds and uh it's heavier than the female with a, and the females average about 1700 kilos or about 3750 pounds and the largest size of these specimens are not definite but there has been record uh, records of Rhinos about 3,600 centimeter uh, kilograms. I mean, or seven th nearly 8,000 pounds, with larger sizes up to 4,500 kilograms or almost 10,000 pounds, uh, have been claimed, but they're not verified. And they have these really cool two horns here, which is sadly the main reason they're kind of endangered. It's made of keratin, so the same thing that makes your fingernails, your hair, it's just pretty much just matted here. It's kind of like a fingernail. But I still think it's a wonderful animal, regardless of its cool horns. And these prunt horns can get pretty big. They average about 60 centimeters long and get up to a meter and a half long in some very exceptional individuals, but only in females for whatever reason. Males don't really have those big horns. And the white rhinoceros is also notable for having this really cool distinct hump on its back. And these really cool ears that have a little bit of hair. They're not very hairy animals. Just got a little bit on the tail there. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. 
So these guys are found in grasslands and savanna habitats, and they're the largest true grazer. So they tend to just just graze. They just eat what they can. Wonderful big animals, and they drink about twice a day when it's available. But conditions are dry. They can live for four to five days without water, and it's been half of the day eating like I wish. One third resting and the rest of the day they just do whatever they want. Their main priority is eating because they have big animals and grass isn't that nutritious so they gotta keep eating, eating, eating. That's a cool sound they make. So one cool thing about these guys is they make lots of mud holes and wallow in them as you can see that that rhino was doing over there and and consider considering like with along with studies of african elephants they believe that white rhinos is actually a driving factor in a lot of ecosystems and these big animals they kind of clear mud they get water they clear trees and they're a big actor in these ecosystems and that's part of the reason why they're so important to protect they help maintain ecosystems that provide us with services like uh oxygen uh, cleaning our air or cleaning our soils they all sorts of different things they produce ecosystems for us to use and enjoy so that's pretty cool and they have a really bunch of cool of cool sounds they make grunts and snorts and really cute bellows they almost sound like they don't come from our rhinoceros but you can sound just hear them here and they usually can live in crashes or herds that can be up to about 14 animals usually mostly female, and sub-adult males will congregate often in association with adult females. Most adult males though are solitary and they mark their territory with their excrement and urine and they may have to 20 or 30 piles of dung uh, to alert passing rhinos that this is their territory and you don't want to mess with them. Do you know what, like, uh, they do this about 10 times an hour while patrolling a territory. The same ritual of is usually uh, used and a territory male would also scrape mark every 30 meters or so a territory boundary and males that are subordinate or they don't want to miss them will not mark their territory and the most serious fight breaks out of the mating rights with females and females do overlap with these territories but they don't really defend it so this is the male i think look at this wonderful big male big boy rhino and let's have a look at the babies while we're talking about the babies and i just want to say they are very very cute is one here. Look at this cute little baby boy. Great little rhinos. Love him, love him, love him. Yeah, it's cute little baby boy. Hell yeah. So yeah, females usually reach sexual maturity to about six to seven years old, while males reach sexual maturity between 10 to 12, since they're going to be bigger and and it's often a difficult affair for them. The male stays uh, beyond the point where the female can act aggressive and will give a call approaching her, because even a male rhino doesn't want to mess with another rhino. <laughs> And the male will chase and block the way the females right squealing and wailing and then they'll try to leave his territory and when they're ready to mate the female curls her tail and gets a stiff stance during the copulation and breeding pairs stay together about 5 to 20 days before going their separate ways. The gestation period for white rhinos is 16 months and a single calf is born that usually weighs between 40 and 65 kilograms. Calves that are unsteady on their feet for the first two or three days in life when threatened the babies will run from their mother which is a very run in front of their mother which is very very important for the calf's protection mother rhinos are very protective of their calves and you don't blame them they've got a high investment and they are very very cute so i don't blame them and weaning starts at about two months old but they may continue to suckle from their mother's uh teats for up to 12 months and the birth interval between these rhinos is about two to three years and before giving birth, the mother will chase off her current calf and they can live up to 40, 50 years in the wild. So they're very long-lived animals. So adult white rhinos have no natural predators due to their size, but young rhinos are usually can be attacked by other animals such as hyenas, lions and such. Now, there have been one successful uh, attempt of a lion pride killing a half-grown wild rhino that weighed a little over a tonne and they managed to do it so these guys tend usually live around mostly in southern africa that's where most of the population is about 98 percent of them but there are five other countries that house these species at the moment including south africa was well, including south africa namibia zimbabwe kenda kenya and uganda and they were almost at the edge of extinction of the 20th century and they've made a tremendous comeback from the southern subspecies in 2001 there was estimated to be 1, 11,670 rhinos in the wild and a further 777 in captivity and by 2007 they had increased to 17,480 so that's pretty good 
So Northern White Rhino is not doing so hot. There's only about two individuals. Uh, and these guys were found around Sudan and the northeastern Republic of the Congo, central to northern Africa. And they have considered to stick to the wild by June 2008, which sucks. So that took them adult. Let's have a look at these guys. So, the big issue for these guys, the elephant in the room, lack for a better word, is the reason they have gone down in numbers, is because of poaching, because of people wanting their horns, and people in Asia particularly believe that horns of rhinoceros give uh, medical properties, like your cancer, all sorts of things. And that is simply not true. There's been no clinical evidence that they do, and it's the properties of this are literally the same as your fingernails. And even though there's lack of evidence, it's still a highly uh, traditional medicine, and that caused the huge decline of Asian rhinos, such as Sumatran rhinos, Javan rhinos, and Indian rhinos, and that has been really hitting Africa as well. So now the black rhino is really down in numbers, and the white rhinos have also been impacted by the trade and it's a really big issue like there have been uh, sometimes like 30 rhinos 30 to 60 rhinos killed every year just by poachers but luckily there has been a lot of effort to an anti-poaching and education and stuff to really really help these populations of rhinos so they look like they're on the up and up and so are other species of rhinos I don't think there's any species of rhino declining at the moment other than maybe the Sumatran rhino but they seem to be all on the up and up now so hopefully that holds and we get more rhinos in our lives because rhinos are a really cool animal we don't want to lose them due to uh, old traditions and basically just because rich people want to have rhino horn it's a social status thing as, as well as a thing. a rhino horn could go for like sixty thousand dollars on the black market and we do not want to have just horns and skeletons to remember these rhinos by because they're really wonderful animals but luckily there are lots of conservation work in place several conservation agencies are working on these guys so the hope is not lost and they seem to be doing okay at the moment just as long as it holds fast and we educate the public especially in asia about rhino horn being not a medicinal product and why rhinos are worth conserving so yeah they're also a pretty common zoo animal. There's estimated to be about a thousand rhinos in captivity worldwide. And there was San Diego Zoo Safari Park and some other zoos like the Old Pinja Conservancy in Kenya. Uh, and also the Durv uh, Kolog Zoo in the Czech Republic had northern white rhinoceros. And then they moved them to Kenya. Though at the moment there's only two. And the only two northern white rhinos are actually on 24 hour arm guard. They're quite used to people. Yeah, wonderful animal and really great. So let's, so let's have a look at the Zoopedia. So as I mentioned, about 18,000, that's what they say here. You can see their range. That's for the southern at the moment. They used to live, they had much bigger range they used to have. So one to five females, uh, one to fives so with one male, four females. So slightly more than the um, Indian rhino. So that's really good. I think they help set it apart. So do dominant male claims territory with females within, so that's pretty cool. Uh, they are polygamous, so they just they do whatever. And you cannot enter the uh, cage with the rhinoceros or habitat. You cannot do that. I wouldn't recommend it. So pretty big animals, 1.78 shoulder, 1.69 shoulder. About 40, 50 years they live in the wild. Pretty big. They reach take five years to reach sexual maturity. Age of sterility is 46 years. Uh, one mating event, uh, 18 months gestation, 60 months uh, into birth, and easy to breed captivity, luckily. Let's have a look at these facts. Yeah, I mentioned that. Largest pure grazer, da da da. They've been seen scars with fights with hyenas, and they have a mutualistic relationship with cattle egrets, red oaks, bull pickers, and cape starlings, three bird species that remove parasites from the skin. That's pretty cool. And I think the really cool thing that they add to this pack is that. Rhinos are enriched by searing by a bunch of different animals. So you can see African buffalo, wildebeest. So they're really good for savannah habitats. And I think that gives them a cool edge over the uh, Indian rhino. So yeah, really wonderful pack and really wonderful animals. So I think this was a really nice pack. Got a really good selection of fan favorites. Uh, especially the white rhino and the meerkats. I think those two were kind of like what everyone was asking for. So they really did do a good job with this pack, and I quite like it, especially with the theme and stuff. 
So yeah, I think this is a great place to end the video. So I really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to click that little bell icon to get notified when I upload anything. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you guys like and subscribe, and bye-bye.